You're listening to a social justice podcast hosted by Nicholas Sperling, brought to you by The Flag Shop, and inspired by a social justice coloring book. Hello, this is a social justice podcast. I'm your host, Nicholas Sperling, and today I'm joined by Nicole Wheat from BC Traits Women's Society. Nicole, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you introduce yourself briefly? Yes, my name is Nicole Wheat. I am an elevator mechanic. That's my main job. I've been doing that for 15 years, followed my dad and my grandfather into the trade. And in that journey, I decided with a group of other women that we need a little bit more representation for women in the trade. So we started the BC Tradesmen Society, and that is actually seven years old on the 22nd. I mean, obviously, it's been an issue of women not being involved in the trades as much as, as men for, for quite a while. And now we have a society that's addressing this. So that's fantastic. This is kind of what this season is all about is talking to organizations that help to address social issues. Whereas in season one, we talked about what the social issues were. And unfortunately, we haven't had a, much of a chance to really get into women in the trades. So I'm really excited for this, especially as a fellow woman in the trades. So uh, really looking forward to this conversation. And before we really get into the, the whole issue of women in the trades, I want to know about the society in particular. How did uh, the BC Trades Women Society start and what is it that you do? We originally started a lot of that advocacy work and getting together and connecting through a Facebook group, which actually works really well for a lot of that work. So there was uh, BC Women in the Trades. It was a private Facebook group, it is a private Facebook group now, has over 3,000 members of it now for uh, women that are working in the trades. It's also open to non-binary, trans women and trans men as well. Eventually, we should probably change the name, but it's just been that it's been that way for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so we were constantly having conversations about like what we could do, meeting up, just supporting and mentoring each other. Uh, in a very natural, organic way. And we saw that there was some funding coming available from the BC government to support initiatives to get more women in the trades or getting other groups that are underrepresented into the trades. And so we decided that we wanted some of that funding. And of course, just as a group of women, we couldn't do that. So we created the BC Tradesmen Society. So Lisa Langevin was the first president and the bullhorn behind a lot of it. She's the one that got me going. She tapped a lot of people on the shoulder and be like, I think you'd be really great at this. Let's work together. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we became society on December 22nd, 2016. Wow. And we're able to work together with other groups, including the BC Fed, CLR, LNG, build together and the building trades and go after some funding from the BC government. And that funding created the BC Center for Women in the Trades, which was our final goal of having like, well, not our final goal, but like our first big goal of like, we knew that we needed an actual center with people whose jobs it was to do the work that we were doing off the side of our desks, you know, on our lunch breaks and after work. Right. And so why is the organization necessary? Like, are there um, barriers that need to be reduced to women accessing positions in the trades? Yeah. So there are so many barriers for women in the trades. We're very underrepresented. The statistics show it's as high as 5% for women in the trades. There's other stats as well. Um, they will include um, other trades such as culinary arts and hairdressing. Statistics I'm looking at, or I'm looking at the building trades specifically, construction trades. And while some are up to 5%, there's a lot of trades like myself and elevator mechanic, we sit at 1% wow. in BC here, and even less when you look across uh, Canada and the States in general. And there's a lot of trades like that. We often call them unicorn trades because there's so few women that like you see one, you're like, oh my goodness, you do this too? How long have you been doing it? Being in a room or on a job site where you're so underrepresented, it can be quite hard and uh, very challenging in a lot of ways. Often you're set to doing tasks that don't actually advance your apprenticeship, uh, not taken seriously of what kind of strength they think you need in order to do the job. And I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of people that uh, were very intelligent, very smart, and usually worked with the thought of lift smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. And there's, there, was, there was always a better way to do something. And you don't have to be the strongest person in the room to get things done. And a more diverse workforce is always a better workforce. So I could fit in little spaces that the other guys couldn't fit in. I got nice little small dainty hands that I could get those tiny little screws that they would fumble over. So we found I found that uh, with the right crew, I was well respected in that regard. But that's not always for everyone. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of women that you'll see all the time. I've Today, even I had conversations with people where they really want to get a break into the trades. They're not sure which one, and, and they're applying it for job postings where people are saying, we're looking, we'll hire anyone. 
and they're not even getting a chance to get an interview often because their name looks to be feminine. I've known women, uh, friends that have applied for jobs that other classmates applied for and they had a higher mark and they were the only one that didn't get hired out of the class. So they reapplied, changing their name to a shortened form that could be interpreted as being masculine. And then they got the interview. We're then told that they don't inter- they don't hire women. You know, do you want to fight that? Yes, in some ways. But at the same time, do you also want to work in an environment where you're not even not even wanted? Mm-hmm. There are so many things, though, so many other barriers. Uh, PPE, often women's PPE, if it even exists, or PPE that will fit a smaller hand, smaller body size, smaller head for hard hats. Smaller ear canals for like hearing protection was a big struggle for me. I got little tiny ear canals. Uh, if they can even find it, access it, it's often more expensive as well. So companies are less likely to want to provide it. You see a lot of sharing of PPE as well, which shouldn't happen, but a lot of companies still do do it. So they'll have a fall harness that fits everyone but, you know, the woman that might be 120 pounds. Mm-hmm. And also for safety of things, you need, if you're not wearing proper safety gear that fits you properly, then you're not being safe. Right. And I find that a lot of it is sort of this macho attitude in some ways, um, because even before I transitioned, I went and applied for a a job as a landscaper. And I was at the time working at a a tent installation company and I was carrying around 200 pounds on my shoulders because that was sort of what was expected of us for whatever reason. And I went to apply to this job and they looked at me and said, you're too small. You're not strong enough. And I knew for a fact I was stronger than a lot of the people there. But it was just the way that I appeared. And as I transitioned, it became more so of that mentality that you're not going to be suitable for this job because you don't have the strength or whatever other reason they're not taking you as seriously for. And uh, it's it can be really tough. Like Some companies are great to work for. Some construction sites are great to work on. And others, you end up just having a horrible experience because no one's taking you seriously. Everyone's talking down to you. And it can really not just affect your ability to get jobs, but also affect your ability to grow within a position. Yeah, that's a, you hear that all the time from women where they'll be complaining like someone just got hired, they have less experience than I do, and they're already getting an opportunity to learn things that I've been asking to learn for like weeks, months, and it's so unfair. And I always tell people like, the best thing you can do is advocate for yourself, be eager. You have to be better than everyone else. And that's unfortunate. You should just be able to be the same as everyone else and succeed. Unfortunately, at this point, that's not the way it is. And at the very end, I go, if it's still not working for you, find somewhere else to work. There are great companies out there that will treat you well, will make sure you're advancing through your career and really good allies. If you can find like the old grumpy dude at the job site that like knows everything and they happen to like you, like that's what happened for me with a couple of times where I just, I happen to find like the old grumpy guy that no one could get along with, really ordinary, but really smart, loved me treated me like a daughter, taught me everything, everything I wanted. And I really excelled through that. But not everyone has that old grumpy Daryl like I did that <laughs> gave me that step up. And I always tell people, if you can't find it where you are, move along. Like don't, don't stay where you're not getting the opportunity because at the end of the day, you need to pay your bills. You need to get through your apprenticeship. Like you can't fight every fight, even though it's unfair and you need to be able to survive. And have you noticed the flip side of that? Um, Because I I was recently talking to someone who was doing renovation work in my building uh, where I live and happened to be a woman in the trade. She owns and runs her own construction company, similarly to what I do, but she was doing it full time. I was doing it part time and we knew that the other was working in the trades. And so we ended up going out and, and grabbing dinner together. And she was telling me that she is able to make so much more money as a woman in the trades because she works for herself. And when people are calling up trying to find a general contractor, a lot of women will say, I don't want some strange man in my house. And because she's a woman and and, uh, safer in their eyes, they will pay sometimes twice as much to hire her, knowing that they're going to have a better experience. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah, there's a there is a group of women uh, that are now networking together and they push each other out there too. They they uh, what they need a plumber like, oh, here's a list of other women plumber company companies. And I think there's a total niche market for that, because, yeah, if you're at home by yourself work, working from home, you don't necessarily want a strange man coming into your home. And uh, we all, you know, many women have experienced, I don't say we all, but many women have experienced feeling ripped off like uh, a man maybe hasn't taken us seriously, whether we'd be buying a car or getting maintenance done on our vehicle or have a plumber coming into the house. Like, are they actually being honest with me? And I've caught people 
being dishonest and trying to pull the wool over my eyes. I'm like, no, I'm actually an elevator mechanic. I know a little bit about the trades and why don't you try this first? Yeah, I work on my own vehicle and I've had the same thing. I went for, I needed brake pads changed. They tried to charge me $2,000 and I went home and did it myself for 60 bucks. I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous what some people try to get away with because they make these assumptions about women that you don't know what you're talking about if if you or when it comes to trades or mechanics. Yeah, there's there's a company in California that's really interesting, and I built it with my vagina. I think that might be the company name or the tagline. Uh, my is a friend of a friend, and she teaches like some basic skills for women mm-hmm. so that they can do some basic plumbing, electrical, like carpentry for themselves. So at least they have a bit of an idea, so they can do a little bit of that stuff around the house on their own. And if they do bring someone in, they still again they have a little bit of skills, so maybe they'll be less likely to be taken advantage of. I thought it was a great great company idea and like just a great resource if i hadn't entered into the trades i'd love to do a course like that where just yeah that basic car you know you should be able to change your own oil change a tire all those basics right it's Mm -hmm. it's really good to be able to do that yeah absolutely and i mean i've noticed when you talk about that niche of uh women wanting to invite other women into their homes as opposed to strange men i've noticed that within queer communities as well where i'll often get work from other queer people who don't feel comfortable inviting a cishet person into their place. And uh, I'm curious to know what your organization is doing to welcome and accommodate trans and non-binary people as well. So we redid our constitution and bylaws last year to include that we represent women, non-binary, trans men, trans women. We are going to be voting on a name change as well, hopefully this year at the AGM. That'll be presented at least. So we do a lot of advocacy work around that, along with working with BCC WIT. We sit on the board for BCC WIT. We have three members that sit on the board for that. Uh, and for our audience, can you clarify? Oh, sorry. BCC WIT is the BC Center for Women in the Trades. Mm-hmm. So that is the paid paid people, paid work, which is amazing, having people do that job full time. So they work at helping um, women, non-binary, trans men, trans women, immigrants, people with disabilities, anyone that's underrepresented in the trades, help them get into the trades. And then f- once they're in the trades, making sure that they're getting opportunities to move beyond that. They're helping women get into positions on boards, into instructing positions, just making sure that women are being represented and and other underrepresented people are being represented at all the different levels through the trades. Because that's the thing, right? You may see women apprentices and you see, you know, I haven't run into many people that are running jobs that are women, especially when I was running running jobs myself. I rarely ran into women in that same kind of position. Mm -hmm. And then having positions, supervisors, and in I think instructors having women, non-binary, trans men, trans women instructors, like people, the first thing they do when they enter into the trades, having representation at that level with a person teaching them things, I think that'll really make a difference and really set set the tone, hopefully, for the rest of the career. Like right from the beginning, they saw representation of other people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. Currently on our board, we have mostly cisgendered. We have one two-spirited person, Barbara James. So she's an indigenous two-spirited uh, woman. And uses she her they them and she's actually working in port hardy right now building her big house as a carpenter she's a red seal carpenter and and teaches part-time for bcit as well and just won a big award at bcit for advocacy work yeah she's she's amazing she's gonna go so far with all the work that she does i'm so proud of her it's so great to like be on a board with her i just feel i feel better just for being around her amazing to have people like that in our lives and uh that those two-spirit perspectives are so important to have and at the same time Every organization that I'm a part of wants to have that representation on the board to the point where I'm hearing from Two-Spirit people saying, can you stop with, with the requests? <laughs> like, there's so many people who want my time. So the fact that you're, you're getting the time from, uh, from this person who is so well-known and, um, and doing so much advocacy work is incredible. Yeah, it's it's I think it's so important when you're on a board to try and yeah, work to make sure you have good representation, right? Like most of the pictures you see of women in the trades are white women in the trades, people mm-hmm. that look like me. And uh, so I try to really work with the rest of the board and the board is amazing. And we really do try to push to like take turns when we're doing different interviews and stuff like that and, and be really just aware of like, you know, not one person is taking all the like face to face interviews and publications and just make sure that we're seeing different representation of other people because I think it's so important for people to see themselves doing a job. It really makes a difference that they can see someone that looks like them. And that's, that's so important. And it just, I don't know, it just makes me feel better and happy when 
when that's what that's what happens and that when the cards actually fall that way and and it does seem to be it is getting better like in the last couple years there's people reaching out to us whether it be companies or organizations unions um we recently just had a really successful event it's the biggest event that we'd ever done uh, motion canada so they are a distributor of ppe and tools and parts uh they had reached out one of their ma- one of their people that work there christina shaw is actually one of our ally memberships for the bc tradesman society and so she had been talking it over with her management about the struggle that women can have for getting ppe that fits them and he he was like well why don't we do an event with the bc tradesman society so they actually found the event space and paid for it and then we had five different vendors come and then we made our holiday social as well so we had a ton of prizes and we had about 100 people attend and women got to try on like there's watson gloves for example which a lot of their gloves they have actually gloves for women and also gloves that go down to extra small and they're actually really nice gloves it's actually what i use for work already so i was just like oh i love these gloves these are great they even have some that are biodegradable now which i thought was really great and i hadn't heard of that yet and i was just like i'm gonna have to do some more research into that i was emceeing the event so i didn't get to look around too much Mm -hmm. um latoplast had their stuff there they have a woman's line for clothing uh, there was a boot vendor, PNF Workwear, women's boots. They're actually great, come in fun colors too, versus just the regular brown and black. And then Helga Wear. So she has um, amazing uh, FR rated coveralls that actually oh. zip so you can go to the washroom without taking your whole thing off. And and it, it fits a woman's body, not every woman's body, but it fits a different body than the men's block. Because like one of the things is like you'll put on like coveralls or pants or like for example, my company doesn't, you know, I don't have work shirts that are besides T-shirts. Their button-ups are only in men's and they're they're too big. And if you're around rotating equipment, that becomes a hazard. Right. People are rolling up their sleeves in order to like, you know, get their hands through the ends and falling up, rolling up the cuffs. And that just becomes such a danger. So it was really nice to have this option of having these companies come by and people could try on the different safety gear. And it wasn't something that necessarily we wanted people to then buy from them because these are all suppliers and vendors that are your company now, you can go to your company and be like, here's a list of suppliers and vendors that actually have safety gear that fit me. Mm-hmm. There's, oh, the fall harnesses, that was the last one. MSA okay. safety, those were really nice too. I'm, I actually, I was really, I really liked one of their fall harnesses. I'm like, that's that's my next one. But uh, we're gonna, we are gonna do a report. We're just doing doing the survey right now and getting the, getting the responses back so that we can kind of do the highlights of like what were the best of each thing. Like people really found really fit well and something that they would normally struggle to find so that we can report that back and, and share that widely across not just our network, but across North America, because they're all worldwide companies for the most part. So people can find that safety gear. And next time the company's like, oh, I can't find anything. You're like, oh, actually, here you go. Here's a list of gloves and harnesses and and shirts that actually fit me. Right. So they can't just write it off like they normally would. Yeah. And it was nice. We did um, a lot of mentoring as well at that event. So just people like talking, making connections. We have people from BCIT, University of Fraser Valley, WorkSafe. Lisa Langevin, the original president, was there, so I got to give her a call out. Amazing. So, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, well, and I want to get to know a little bit about what it is that you do and how you got into the trades as well. So your position right now is an elevator mechanic, yep. is that what you said? So what inspired you to do that type of work? So I excelled in school. I was, like, on a roll, academic, and uh, also got along with my dad really well I was always like would go for when he would do maintenance and was on call I would go with him as a child and stuff like that and loved playing around in the garage with him when he was fixing things and did all my own oil changes but even though I loved all that and had my own tool set because like at a young age I was like dad I have to get tools he's like well you have my tools I'm like but I'm not gonna live at home forever he was like fair enough so like starting at like 15 16 he'd get me a tool a tool or so every year every holiday to go to my collection but I was an academic so it was just like Gen- I just, you know, obviously I was going to go to university. Mm-hmm. So I did university for a couple of years. Uh, criminology, loved it, uh, but it wasn't going to work out. I wanted to be an RCMP officer and that wasn't going to work out. So I went off, lived in Taiwan for a couple of years and taught English. Came back, tried university again, doing English, did some landscaping on the side. Mm-hmm. I was just kind of like, I wasn't feeling it. I was just like, what am I going to do with this degree? And my dad was actually talking to um, a friend and was talking about how the elevator union was hiring. You know, you call this number at this time and they take the first hundred applicants or whatever. And and I was like, me? My dad's like, what? And I'm like, I want to do it. My dad's like, yeah, you, you'd you be great at this. My dad, like, I'm so fortunate that my dad raised my sister and I as just like gender wasn't ever a construct of like what we could and couldn't do. Like, 
he was like we were you know my sister and I are very different she's not big on the tools I am like she's very artistic she's a great writer she's a teacher she's a kindergarten teacher and uh she's fantastic at that and, and I was I always lean more towards the tools and the dirt biking and horseback riding and but he was so yeah he's like yeah of course you can do this like why wouldn't you be able to do this and and so he supported me and I wrote the test I passed and then I got hired and that was in 2008 and it just kind of went from there. I started out on the island because that's, that's where I grew up in Ninus Bay, a tiny little town, with just an elementary school. And mm-hmm. worked in Nanaimo and Comox and Courtney and Port, Hart, Port Alberni. And then uh, work slowed down a little bit um, just before the Olympics in the construction trade. And so I was off for about a year. And then it picked back up. I got picked up by Otis Elevator and did a couple projects for them on the island. And then it was really busy again in Vancouver and I was working with a couple of the union brothers there and from they were from Vancouver and they're like come over to Vancouver it'll be great you'll love it I was just like ah the big city and it's you know I was I've been very fortunate in my union I've been I've been treated very well but that was you know I had a small pool of guys to work with I was just like you know I'm going from like a dozen guys that I regularly am around to hundreds and I wasn't right I was a little bit unsure about that but they convinced me and I made the jump and I moved here in 2012, so uh, I never looked back within like two weeks. I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm never going back to the island. I'm so happy here where I am. And yeah, that was 2008, got into the union 2009, came out to Vancouver 2012. I uh, worked a few different companies on the island and then switched over to Otis was the company I came over with, did eight years with them. Uh, again, I worked with Daryl, who was an amazing, amazing gentleman. And he taught me so much. And because of him, I was able to start as soon as I became a mechanic within a couple of months, I was running jobs and then adjusting elevators, which is uh, so normally you install an elevator as a mechanic. And then at the end, someone often comes in after and adjusts it to final inspection. So I was actually able to do it start to finish um, because of working with people that were just brilliant. And I absorbed as much as I could. So not anywhere near to their level, but I was able to get it done with some phone calls. And and uh, then I switched companies uh, about five years ago because I wanted to learn some, something new. And I was just working new construction at Otis. And so I switched over to TK Elevator. And now it's where I've been for almost, it'll be five years in February doing service work. So I'll go into, it's nice. I get I get warm washrooms, flushing toilets, and actual soap and hand washing Ooh. stations, which is supposedly coming in in uh, BC now. With the new with the government they've passed a get flushed. I think was it was what it was called. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing as well for people in the trades is not having sanitary washrooms. It was especially an issue during COVID. Like it yes. really became a focus of. I I got on bad terms with one of my previous bosses because I was advocating for a, a flushing toilet in a sink. Yeah, (laughs) it's not that much to ask for. It's like there's supposed to be one for women on the job site. Sometimes there is. Mm -hmm. Often there isn't. Often I would just find the closest coffee shop and buy coffee there every day and and be nice and polite. And they would always let me use their washroom. But Mm -hmm. there's they're disgusting. You're lucky if they get cleaned once a week. They're often out of toilet paper. There's all kinds of horrible, disgusting graffiti all over the inside of them. That's just Mm -hmm. it's not sanitary. No one man, woman, non-binary should have to use those they should have proper flushing toilets and they should be cleaned daily Mm -hmm. and people should then respect them so that we get to keep them (laughs) yes that's another big thing but yeah service has been great i get yeah washrooms toilets sometimes there's tampons in the washroom for free i'm like that's amazing (gasps) yeah it's it's nice world's changing slowly 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 but surely yeah (laughs) yeah it's uh it was a nice change i get to work on old elevators i'm a lot greasier versus dusty Mm -hmm. new construction but every day it's i'm learning something which is what i love i love learning so whether it be at work or like with everything being online now there's so many amazing courses you can take often for free or or a low amount of money online and so I'm always doing some kind of course as well quite often or some kind of workshop right so what is your favorite aspect of working as an elevator mechanic I love that I'm always troubleshooting Mm -hmm. there's always I always have to think about something it's a nice blend of various trades so it's mechanical so I get my wrenches and my ratchets out and screwdrivers and then all the electrical as well Mm -hmm. um this week i was you don't get to do it very much anymore but i was soldering boards so i was working with Mm. my solder sucker and my solder gun and having some fun there these are like the electrical boards that are powering the yeah neat yeah i like it's something my my dad and my grandfather because my grandfather was in the trade as well and they they love they were both troubleshooters they're both really brilliant men and and they love that aspect of it as well. Like you were never going to be bored. It's never going to be the same every day. And I like that aspect that like I could be working on an elevator that's 100 years old to something that was just installed last week. 
Uh, it's a lot to know. You'll never get to know everything, that's for sure. Um, there are some brilliant men in the elevator trade, and it's always good to be very nice to them and be friendly with them so they can help you out when you get yourself stuck in a bind where you're like, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Well, and I imagine that not a lot of people do that type of work anymore either because when you think about older electronics, people would take them apart and repair them. Mm-hmm. But that's not really the culture that we have anymore. It's just planned obsolescence. We get something, we throw it away. You can't really have planned obsolescence in an elevator. You don't, I mean, you might be able to in some regard, but not uh, in the sense that one day it's just going to completely fall apart with someone inside of it. So you obviously have to maintain those mm-hmm. aspects quite well. Yeah, elevators are usually maintained monthly. Mm-hmm. So once a month, I'll get a visit and then you do the modernizations or upgrades. So I do a lot this week. I've been re, uh, removing drives and putting in new drives. So that's kind of what controls the elevator, the motor on like how fast how slow coming into floors and stuff like that. It's mm. I do a lot of like door operators. So that's the mechanism that'll open and close the doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, safety devices like braking, emergency braking, safety devices. I'm doing that some of those next week. And then we get a lot of like water damage. So mm-hmm. when the someone sets off a sprinkler by hitting it or a fire and the water comes down the hoistway, all those electronics have to be replaced. So you usually like last Friday, I was trying to like you know, both of their elevators were down. It was a social housing building. A lot of people in wheelchairs that need to navigate, need the elevator. They couldn't navigate the stairs. And I think it was 17 stories too. Like that's a lot to navigate. So we were able to get one of them working. So you kind of like, you get to that point where you're just like, there's so many elevators. You're never going to be able to keep all the boards in stock and stuff like that. But you have some stuff in stock. So we were able to like, kind of look at what was happening. Okay, what got hit by water? Let's dry everything out and just kind of between the two elevators, cobble it together so we could at least get one working for now. And then you kind of go through and you look at, what are all the other things that are going to need to be replaced and start ordering them? And so like anything, anything that moves will have to get replaced. If you had to give a general idea of what it's like to be a woman in the trades, what would you tell people? How would you explain that to them? Um, the positives of being a woman in the trade is that you learn the skills to be able to do so many things in your home yourself. Mm-hmm. You gain the confidence to, to try things that you never would have tried to do before. I built this cool hanging apparatus that I hang plants off that has a winch that I like lift up and and bring down so for me to water it because I have like a skylight and some vaulted ceilings in my condo. I never would have tried that before being in the trades. Mm-hmm. The hard part is often when you're on a job site or at a company, you have to be so much better than the men that you work around to prove that you deserve to be there. That can be really hard, especially like every time you have a new supervisor, every time you have a new job site, it's, it's almost the same. It's often the same thing where you just have to prove every time that you belong there. They expect the man's an elevator mechanic or a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter. Like they expect when they hire them, when they walk on the job, that that's, they can do the job. Mm-hmm. As a woman, it feels like you have to prove that you can do the job every time. That can be really hard. And that's a lot of microaggressions where like it might not just be one big thing, but at the end of the day, it can, it can really add up and be really hard, which is where that mentorship and just having people that understand and having someone just to vent to sometimes can really make a difference because uh, it can be very isolating. Like being the only woman on a job site, which happens so often over the last 15 years for me, it's like you can't hide or blend in. Like it doesn't matter Like I wore all men's clothing, hard hat. My hair is up in my hard hat. You couldn't see it. I don't wear makeup. And I just couldn't blend in. It didn't matter. So I just always, the looks, like everything you're doing, you're always getting watched. Like I would unload the elevator with the telehandler and just knowing that everyone, I can see everyone watching me. And it's just, you know, you just have to be on your best behavior. And like that can be a little bit draining as well. I've worked with such amazing people. I was very fortunate, like being in an elevator shaft, hiding most of the time versus having to wander around the job site. So I definitely had that protection. And, and my union brothers were fantastic in just keeping me safe and and kind of scaring away the riffraff. Do you find there's an element to um, having to just sort of shut up and take it because otherwise you might be out of a job? Yeah, I'm protected quite well because I'm in a union. Like that does give me an extra protection. Not to say that every union's amazing and everyone's situation is the same. For me, the unions definitely protected me. Uh, I would have never gotten hired. The non-union elevator company, the largest one here in BC, as far as I know, they've never hired a woman. Mm. Uh, and it's been said from one of the owners at one point that they wouldn't hire a woman. Wow. And I don't think that I would have gotten the chance, even with these companies, necessarily as a woman with the experience that I had. Uh, the union hired me. They, it's a hiring board. So the company says, I need this many apprentices and you get what you get. 
and I was one of the people they got. So they didn't really have a choice. And I proved myself. Uh, there's a tradesman, I think Lisa said it once, that we'll know we're succeeding as like women in the trades and underrepresented people in the trades when one of us can just be just as bad as one of the bad guys and it doesn't reflect poorly on the rest of us. Because at this point right now, if one woman does poorly or even just isn't excelling in the top 10%, uh, it really can reflect poorly on everyone else, all the other people. And that's just, just so unfair for that woman as well. That's a lot of extra stress on someone when they're just trying to learn and trying to figure stuff out that like you have to be great. Otherwise, it, we, it looks bad on all of us. And also that's a form of gatekeeping too. I see there's a lot of gatekeeping sometimes by underrepresented people and women towards others because they're like, we have to be this good. And if you're not this good, it's going to reflect poorly on, a, on all of us. And that's not fair. Everyone should be able to like just exist and do a job and be just as bad as the worst guy on the job site. You know what I mean? Right. Well, you're never going to get to a point of having gender equity or or um, gender parity within an organization if the people who are average are being told you're not good enough and we have to bring in a man instead. Yeah. There are so many hardships being underrepresented in the trades, but it's such a great job. Like you don't have to go to university for four years or, or beyond that if you're getting your master's or doctorate and end up tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what you're doing in debt, often you can start out right walking onto a job site, not knowing much yet. Mm -hmm. And then your apprenticeship, if you're going through a union, sometimes it can be funded, there's bursaries. But even if you're paying the full amount, it's not that much. It's not nearly as much. And you're learning and as you work as well and you're getting paid well. There's such great paid paying jobs out there in the trades and a lot of good ones with pensions and benefits. And everyone deserves those options. There's, there's quite a few people in the trades where there's just one, one, one parent working as well. And everyone deserves that. I've had women uh, been told before that they're taking away a man's job and a, an ability for him to feed his family. And like women deserve to feed their family too. Right. It's just a weird, it's such a weird thing to say. And it was coming from another woman in the, in the one case that I'm thinking of too. And that was just like, she's, she's badass. And so she was like, she's like, yeah, I deserve this job. And I'm really good at this. I have a family too to feed. Mm -hmm. And so she had a quick retort and, and the woman was kind of like, ah, and like continued on with her, with her uh, little pram and her baby. <laughs> but I was, it was a, it was an interesting thing. And she's like, I wasn't expecting it from a woman, but. Yeah. I mean, most women that I encounter when I'm dressed in my construction clothing are, either ignoring me or coming up to me and saying, wow, it's so cool to see a woman in the trades. And, and that's usually the response that you get. But that sort of attitude of it's a man's world and, you know, women are taking jobs away from men. is such like a 1950s sort of attitude, right? Yeah, it's an odd one. Often I get asked, people ask me, they're like, what's it like in the trades? Like, are the old guys the worst? I'm like, no, the old guys treat me like a daughter. I go, sometimes it's the guys that are my age that get a little bit weirder, like... Mm -hmm and a little bit more uh, problems with. But yeah, most of the old guys, they might not use the right language, say the right things, but like they mean well. Yeah, I've noticed and, that as well. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on why that might be? I think sometimes it is just that they think of you like a daughter. Mm -hmm. They're like, if my daughter wanted to do this, my daughter could do this. You get that kind of attitude as well. They'd want, they like, I want her to be treated well and be given, given the same opportunities as as a man would get. Right. So maybe some of the other employees haven't had families yet or aren't going to. And so they don't have that understanding of what it's like to have a daughter and to want them to have equal opportunities to, to men. Yeah, that might be it. It's also, I think, maybe just insecurity and competitiveness because you're in that same kind of age bracket as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's interesting how some people react so differently than others and how surprised you can be at sometimes like the person you're like oh this is the person i have to worry about and they end up being your biggest advocate and and just really championing you i think there's a lot of great things happening now with all these different organizations across canada the united states and even the world so there's all kinds of different tradesmen groups and they're really advocating to get more underrepresented people in the trades and not just get them in the door because like the the recruitment's happening all over the place but sort of retention that's so hard mm -hmm. and like making sure that once they get in the door that they're supported they're getting the chance to move through the steps that they need to go to be a great journey person when they get to that point mm -hmm. and be feel valued and having the opportunity to learn skills so they can 
move up into running a job site, being lead hand, whatever it may be, being a supervisor. We have, um, at the company I'm working at now, we have two women supervisors that were actually worked in the field. We had the first woman, Barbie, who was the first woman in Canada, I think, as far as I know, in the elevator trade. And uh, she's a supervisor. And, and now Anne as well has moved from the field into a supervisor position. And that's, that's fantastic that having women in those positions shows other women too, that like, look, you can, that is an advancement you can make. You can also be an inspector. I'd like to see a woman inspector for technical safety BC for the elevator. I know there's women boilermakers and electricians and stuff like that as well, but I don't think there's been a woman in the technical safety for the elevating devices yet. Right. We've sort of talked about what are some of the positive aspects of being a woman in the trades? What are some of the negative aspects for you? What is the most surprising thing that you've discovered about women in the trades? I think it might be, okay, I know what it is. They, almost every single woman that I've worked with in the trades is badass. Like there's just so many women that are just like, they're like, I don't like what's happening. And rather than just sitting back and complaining, I'm going to make something happen. I'm going to advocate for myself. I'm going to advocate for other people. I'm going to start a society. I'm going to, I'm going to start a mentoring group. And there's so many women that just, rather than just sitting back, and being like, this sucks and I don't know what to do about it. Just like that type A personality that just like, let's go fix it. Let's work together. Like every time we plan something, there's always such great ideas, whether it be like the PPE event that all came together so quickly. There's a couple other, we're having another PPE event most likely in the spring because this one was so successful. Like before the night had even finished, Motion was like, let's do it again. I was like, okay, after Christmas, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, give yourselves a break. I think we have a couple other ideas planned with some other groups. After that event, we had a lot of groups come up to us and be like, hey, can we be involved next time? And I was like, yes, that would be fantastic because mm -hmm. I work 40 hours a week doing something else and I only have so many hours and the rest of the board, same for them. And, and I find that most of the women that I do this work with, they also do other advocacy work and other volunteer positions. Like very few of us just do one thing. And uh, I think that's amazing. It's it's kind of amazing to just have this group of people that are like willing to to take on any challenge and from so many different like lines of work too. So many people enter into the trades not at like I entered in at 26, mm -hmm. but a lot of people enter in in their 30s or 40s and they have this other lived experience and other careers that they did before that have they have these skills that are fantastic for all these other projects and all these other ideas and. I love that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, reflecting on my experience of interacting yeah. with women in the trades, everyone is a badass. You're right. And I, it probably is um, symptomatic of, of a problem as well, right? Where uh, you, you kind of have to be a badass to make it in the industry because of all the barriers that are put in place. But also really cool that these are people that are championing that cause, um, whether it's intentional or not, right? Sometimes advocacy work is just doing your job it, when you're in a minority in that position. Yeah, for sure. I do love that it is so positive. And our like our social media group that everything kind of spurn, spurned out of, uh, they do a really good job. It's not perfect, but it's, it's generally quite positive. I'm part of other social media groups for uh, women in the trades and underrepresented people in the trades, and, and they can be a lot more negative. In BC, having the fact that two out of the three admins are queer. Uh, I think that also makes a difference. That really sets the tone as well. Uh, we are welcoming to non-binary trans women, trans men, and anyone that says anything differently will be quickly removed from the group. Mm -hmm. And I think we've created that safe place. It can always be safer and better. But uh, I think that positive in that framework has been really nice here locally which, yeah, I don't always see. I have um, one of my friends, uh, Fiona, so she's in the elevator trade and is a trans woman and, and is like a co-chair for um, Otis Pride, which is amazing. She's still an apprentice and she's already like doing all this amazing work. She's in Seattle. And she's, you know, she's really noticed, like there's a couple of the groups and she's just like, she's like, they're just, it's it's hard. It's not nearly the same as like, as some of the smaller groups or some of the more regional groups. Once you open them up to a more diverse population, even though it's mostly women, it's still you're, it's still quite diverse when you're looking across the world or North America. Mm -hmm. And creating those safe places, I think, is so important. When it comes to the underrepresentation of women in various industries, I know that there are some trades where that's not the case, but um, in most trades, there's an underrepresentation of women. So how do you think that that gets 
addressed and, and why do you think that that is still an issue for us now? I think it's a whole lot of things. There's not really one thing. It can be instructors that are not teaching women or telling them You're, this is going to be too hard. For, that's going to be too hard for you, which at the very beginning of your career to have your instructor not be welcoming and, and not give you the chance to succeed can be such a blow that that stops people. People finding that they're not getting the chance to progress through their apprenticeship, getting the same treatment as other apprentices are. There's the amount of harassment is it's better than it was. But it's blatant. It's all over the place. And the things that happen still, still weekly, even here in BC, is tragic. It's hiring practices. There was just a posting like two weeks ago from a company in Coquitlam that said it was a laborer position. It said men only. Like in BC, in the lower mainland, in 2023, like... My home city. You're not allowed to do that. It's illegal. And, and they, were, they were called out. Uh, you can't do anything unless someone applies for the job, doesn't get it, and then starts a case. Mm -hmm. Just by doing the posting, you can't do anything. Things like that. And they're not usually going to be upfront about it either. Like no. every time I've had an employer discriminate against me and, and not hire me, and I, I know it's because I'm trans. Every time it's happened, they've never framed it that way. They've never said, we're not going to hire you because you're trans. It's your personality doesn't fit with our company culture, they, right? There's buzzwords that you'll hear from any organization because they don't want to find themselves in a human rights case, but they also don't want to just be diverse in their hiring practices. Yeah, it's also, there's so many things. You're right, exactly that. It's not usually as blatant as men only. <laughs> that one was pretty blatant. We were like, what? You said the quiet words out loud <laughs> in writing. <laughs> but... It's so often people, like I was talking about earlier, about changing your name to a more masculine, shortened form or an initial. And that also happens for immigrants, too, or not even immigrants. They could be like fourth generation Canadians, but their last name is something that isn't Smith. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, they're less likely to be hired. Their university or their technical school is not from Canada. Again, so they're discriminated in that. There's so many ways that people get discriminated against. Like you're talking about the stature earlier. Like, oh, you're smaller. You're not going to be able to lift. Like, give me a chance to lift stuff. Like mm -hmm. the elevator industry, like our rails are hundreds of pounds. Lift smarter. There's tools for that, right? I can do a lot of work with a two-wheel dolly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that one always confused me too because I, I guess people have in their minds that you need to look like a bodybuilder to be strong. Mm -hmm. And in reality, those muscles are typically for show. It's usually the people who... They might look like they're muscular or fit, but they're, they have strong muscle because you don't want all that bulk getting yeah. in the way when you're trying to do various uh, trades jobs or, or maybe you're a rock climber or a cross country skier or something like you have to make sure that that muscle is doing everything that it can for you without being too bulky. Yeah, for sure. Also, it's the height. I get the height. I've gotten the height a lot because yeah. I'm only five foot six, like five foot seven with my boots on, but. Yeah, I'm always that one inch too short, I swear, every time. <laughs> I actually did got asked by a plumber this week if I was a rugby player, so I'm guessing oh. I'm looking a little bit stronger than I used to be because... <laughs> That's kind of how construction clothes fit, too, yeah. right, for women. <laughs> I, was just like, I was like, no, no rugby. I used to play soccer a lot, though. <laughs> oh. He was a nice gentleman. But uh, it, was, it, was, it was funny. It made me laugh. There's all different kinds of things. That are, I think it just adds up to a lot of things. Not having the proper PPE and work clothes, that's just so rude. Like, you can't even outfit someone in the gear that's key and keep them safe and make them presentable at their job as well. Such a minor expense for a company compared to the cost of hiring someone and you know, paying their EI and wages and everything else. Yeah. And I bring up to the to people all the time when they talk about, like, strength in the trades, like as you and I were talking, I go, I don't want someone moving 700 pounds. They're going to blow out their shoulder and then they're hurt. And WCB says something like 40 pounds is the maximum. Like 50 or 70 or something like that. Like, mm. I think also like the hiring process, that's, that's one of the biggest things too for, for general recruitment is make sure that's fair. Like everyone's getting a chance to apply and get to the interview. And that's one of the biggest things. Like who's, who's doing the hiring? Mm. Are, are they the kind of people that should be doing the hiring? Do they know general like, requirements of BC law and labor law and and anti-discrimination like that I think is a big barrier where people don't even get a chance to prove themselves mm -hmm. and then once they get in there yeah it's the PPE it's harassment of other people not getting a chance to excel and move through their apprenticeship 
not getting paid the same. I hear that one a lot where someone will get hired on, they have less experience, they're just new at the company, less schooling, and they're getting paid like two, three dollars more than someone that's been working at the company for four years. The only difference is one's a man and one's a woman. Like mm -hmm. like that that's that's bullshit. Like that just shouldn't happen. And that's people hear that and they just don't feel valued at all. And and sometimes they move on to a different company and find a great company. And sometimes it, that just might be the last thing. And they're like, I'm done. I'm moving on and I'm, I'm leaving the trades. And I've, I've seen a lot of amazing people leave the trades that if they had been given just a fair chance, just a fair chance, they would have excelled and been amazing mm -hmm. because they were so good and they had the talent and they had that attention to detail and they could totally do the work. They just weren't given the opportunity. And it was just too many in your face moments over and over again that they just they just didn't want to do it anymore they gave up yeah i think that's totally understandable there were so many moments when i wanted to give up jobs in the trades because of that exact situation where my coworkers have less experience than i do they're getting paid more than i am they're getting raises i'm not getting raises and um you just get really frustrated and um either stick out stick it out with the company for far too long and end up being pushed out or you leave of your own accord and find another company. But either way, you're probably not staying with that company for very long if they're treating you that way. Yeah, for sure. I'm also a crier when I get really angry and frustrated, which I hate <laughs> because I was like, my anger comes through my tears. And like where I'll get so frustrated at treatment, whether it be uh, I've had some really bad GCs, general contractors over the years where they're like, what are you she doing here? And just getting so frustrated. I'm, just, I'm like, I've got to take my moment. Can I go to my shack? give my apprentice and other mechanics something to do. And I'm just like, I'm just going to go have a little cry. Leave me alone for 15 minutes. It's just, you're just so frustrated sometimes. It's just like that last thing of that day where you're just like, this week has been horrible. Like just, you would never have said that to me if I had a dick. Like, it's just, it just, it's so, it's like, what does, what does my gender have to do with my, with my worth at this job? Like I'm really good at this and I'm running this site right now with, you know, two, three, four, however many people I have on site, just let me do my job and respect me. And, and just, it's so frustrating when it's just because I'm a woman, you're treating me differently. And if my name was Tom, it would be different. Like I don't, it's, it's it can be so. And the crying aspect really, too is one of those things where there's nothing wrong with crying, yeah. but men will often view that as a weakness. And so you sort of, if you're trying to fit in on a site, you have to hide that from yeah. everyone, right? Well, I'll, I'm now, now I'm so, it's so different now. I have the better words for it a lot of the time. And, and I'm in a position of power now. I've been in the union and the trade for 15 years. I've excelled. Um, I was, you know, headhunted to switch companies. Like, they called me. And I'm a bit more strong, I guess, with it all. And now, like, with someone will say something, if I cry or someone else is crying, I go, they're like, and they'll say, oh, she's being emotional. I'm like, yeah, throwing things? Also emotional. Mm -hmm. Just a different kind of emotion. Right. I'm like, that's also emotional. So And crying's a lot healthier than throwing. Yeah, less likely of hurting someone by crying. Mm -hmm. The cowboyism on the job sites is still obviously I think a big barrier too that can like you see things that each site is so different. I've been on sites where the safety was amazing, it's clean, it's tidy, like there is no graffiti in the washroom which is amazing. There's only one site that I was like that. And it was gone. Like if it went and they were, you were kicked off the site. And then you're on other sites where you're, it's so dangerous and the stuff happening around you is so unsafe and you're just trying to keep yourself safe and your crew safe and you're seeing things and you're trying to stop things around you. And I think that can be really hard too when people are like, I want to go home. I have, you know, I got a dog to walk, kids, husband, wife, whatever. But like, I want to go home safely. And, and this job site is really making that hard. And like it's another thing that you just kind of throw onto the pile and and people just feeling like that's the way it's always been. Like, oh, tradesmen have always sworn and been obnoxious and bully the bullying and harassment you see to, amongst each other as well. And as if it's an excuse. As if it's an excuse or like everyone's norm. Like I grew up with two tradespeople and my dad never swears. Very polite, well spoken, reads his newspaper every day and does this crossword please and thank you it, maintenance route all the older older ladies were always giving them cookies and stuff like that like mm -hmm. it, not every tradesperson has to be that rough gruff swearing rude bullying like we can move on beyond that now and make it a nice genuine safe job site where lots of people feel welcome yeah well I have clients comment on this all the time they, they're surprised that I'm not 
blasting music, swearing all the time. And I kind of go, but why? Like everyone has their own different interests. Like I, when I work, I like to listen to audiobooks, for instance. I don't like to blast music. And typically I'm very silent when I'm working. I'm just focused on what I'm doing. And I would assume that a lot of people will like to work that way or might have a different way that's not swearing and blasting loud <laughs> music that they like to work. But for some reason, it's shocking to other people if if you work in any way other than that. Yeah, the, the, the norm that they, they envision as a stereotypical construction. Mm-hmm. Like if you're a plumber and you don't see your butt crack, that's unusual. Yes. It's not just, yes. well, some people don't like to have their butt crack going, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I like I, I would always love going onto a job site with a GC and seeing their face sometimes. I had one job, it was in South Surrey, and I walked in with my apprentice, and my apprentice was uh, him and his wife are both like, not weightlifting, but like bodybuilders. Like he's mm-hmm. he wasn't m- too much taller than me, like but really built, and uh, great guy, awesome, awesome apprentice. And we walk in to the the trailer, and um, I'm like, I'm here. I see the elevator parts have been delivered. I see you've moved them. Please make sure if you need anything moved, you talk to me. Some stuff's already been damaged. Um, these are things I'm gonna need off need from you in the, the first week. As well as I've counted, you know, this many extension cords, often before the elevator people get there, people will loop their extension cords from floor to floor through the elevator shaft. Mm. But once I'm there, they can't have that. I have to make sure the screening's safe, all the handrails are up so nothing falls down at us. And we're not moving and snagging an extension cord and creating a, a hazard that way. So I'll usually go, I've checked everything, go in, do my report to them. And they just like, it was like three guys and they were just like looking at me with like slack jawed. I was just like, Hello? <laughs> Are you, can you see me? And then they're like, who are you? I'm like, I'm the elevator mechanic. I'm going to be installing and then adjusting your elevator and putting it through inspection. This is Kelly, my apprentice. <laughs> they were just like, they were just didn't even really answer. They were very confused. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll get back to you, but I'm going to need those floor height levels and you have till tomorrow to get those cords out. Otherwise I'll get them out. Mm-hmm. And when I get them out, I, the typical elevator person thing is to like cut them. I usually like wrap them up and like put them nice and neatly and then put them in a closet somewhere. So eventually someone will find it, but it's out of my way. It's out of my space. I've give, I give them a warning and then I remove it myself. Mm-hmm. But I walked out of the trailer and I called my, my supervisor at the time, Ross. And I was like, Hey Ross. He's like, yeah. I'm like, these guys are going to call you. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, Oh, they were not expecting a woman to walk into that room. I go, they weren't, they couldn't even talk to me. He's like, no. And he's like, Oh, my phone's ringing oh it's them and he just laughed he called me back he's like i told him that you're the best one i have and that you're going to be running the site he goes they were so surprised he goes hopefully they're better but like he was actually he was a really good supervisor he's like check in tomorrow and let me know if it's if it's gonna be a problem i come down there and they ended up being better they were not uh experienced contractors so i think i really threw them through a loop you know being a woman and installing an elevator but it was an interesting site yeah wow people's assumptions when it comes to trying to encourage women to join the trades, what would you tell someone to entice them into into taking up a trades job? So if someone's interested in trades, I often recommend like a trade sampler course. Mm-hmm. So I think they have them at Camosun, BCIT, and UFV because they'll get to learn a variety of different trades, usually like electrical, plumbing, sheet metal, a couple other ones, welding. And so I'm not sure. Usually it's a couple months, I think, the courses. So I learn a variety of basic trade skills, tools, they usually end up with a couple of tickets of some sort, whether it be like forklift or first aid, mm-hmm. usually something else. And they get that like first little like foray into the different trades and to kind of see which one suits them. Which one is there one of those trades that they're like, Ooh, I really like this. And this came like, this is something I'd really like to pursue. And then because you've already started at that technical school, they'll also be able to help you get through to the next steps for your apprenticeship, your pre-app or your year one, year two. It gives you a little bit of experience. I often tell people if they can try the unions, the unions do seem to have for the most part, better representation than non-union does. You have that extra support as well. If you are, if there is something happening, you can go to your union if there's an issue. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always, it isn't always the best case that the union's the best thing. There's a lot of people have amazing jobs outside of the union or contractors on their own and whatnot but it is something i often suggest often some of the unions also have schooling that's included so you're that's even less money you have to put out i tell them to once they figure out which one they want or a couple they want just start applying apply at the union like go through the phone book or the or the google the website and just go through all the companies and start applying 
find out. I go, don't wait for them to say that they're hiring because trades are always hiring. Right. So just keep applying. Uh, often if they're having, uh, today I was talking to someone, um, I think it was on Reddit actually, uh, that was looking into it. I go, it's not necessarily fair or right, but use your first initial mm-hmm. or shorten your name and then reapply and try that again. At least it gets you in the door to get a chance. That's the hardest thing. If you don't already have any trade skills as a woman, getting that call back and getting those first like six months, a year of skills can be really difficult to get your foot in the door. I, yeah. I often talk about how when I transitioned, I noticed a massive difference. Oh, I bet. And I mean, I still use the name Nick on my resume for that exact reason. But even then, when someone Googles your name, they might find out that you're a woman or in my case, a trans woman who is uh, a candidate for the BC Green Party, two <laughs> things that may not sit well with some construction folks, right? And I used to have really high success rate sending out resumes. I would send out two resumes, I'd get one call back. I'd have two interviews, I'd get one job offer. When I transitioned, it went down to 200. So for every 200 resumes I sent out, I'd get a call back. Still to this day, I've never had a job offer from sending out a resume. That's At, crazy. Um, and it, it can be incredibly difficult. But one of the things that has allowed me to continue getting work is maintaining really good connections, whether it's through social media or in person, but having sort of a network of people that know that you're skilled, that can contact you. Um, I've had jobs through Facebook, including this one. My boss just reached out to me on Facebook and decided to hire me, Um, but construction jobs as well, just posting in some different Facebook groups. And um, I've had different companies like Bell Construction, for instance, is a, a really good one for women in the trades in in construction but you keep contact with these groups and they'll reach out to you every once in a while like every couple years I'll get a company that reaches out to me and offers me a job and we'll have a conversation about it and so far it hasn't worked out (laughs) but you know they're always interested so they're clearly always looking for people yeah it's there's always work out there it's but that's, that's the thing it's very interesting and I've heard this from other trans women as well the before and after whether it be your name being a woman or find like you said they look you up and they find out you're a trans woman on top of that mm-hmm. the intersectionality of that right that's that's a huge thing that people forget about too like having you know a person of color and a woman like that intersectionality on a job site can be even worse even harder but it is so hard to like break into the trades sometimes it is really needing to know someone i get a lot of like i'm always hoping that more women will get into my trade we uh we just had a new one hired and i'm really excited so as soon as she got hired, I knew her her husband's in the trade. So it's a lot, a lot of knowing someone to get into the elevator trade. So I'd, I uh, didn't ha- wasn't friends with him on Facebook, but I found him. I was like, "Hi, your wife got hired. Here's my phone number and my name. She can add me onto Facebook. I have all these groups I want to make her a part of, as well as a group <laughs> chat of the twelve of us now that are here working in BC. Because if someone enters into any trade, but like obviously my home trade, like my my trade especially, I want them if they're going to fail i want them to fail because they couldn't do it not that they didn't get the opportunity to succeed so i do everything i can like who are you working with are you getting the right ppe do you have any questions is there something that you're dealing with that you don't want to deal with i'll deal with it for you like there's you know the first time someone got pregnant in recent years uh she came to me and she's like i'm gonna have a baby and no one knows yet like am i gonna be able to start school i'm like oh legally yes they have to let you and i have all the legislation on that i'm like i will do some groundwork it's hard when there's so few of you because they're like you know they're always like well there's only so many options and nicole says she's never having kids the other one's too old but uh i was just like i kind of laid the groundwork of like hey there is someone this is happening You'll find out when you find out. But just so you know, she has to be allowed to do school even if she's on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. It's not like so with our schooling, if you don't have the hours or you're not working, you don't get to start school. And so she was worried that because she was going to have to do maternity like right around the time school would be starting. It was really touch or go. And uh, but I I let the they they seem to know already. They already they already had done a little bit of their own research, I guess. But I made sure that that was the case. And then her mechanic had actually contacted me. And it's like, I don't think you know yet, but this person's pregnant and she's the best apprentice I've ever had. I'm so excited for her to come back after maternity, come work with me again. Mm-hmm. But I will, he was, it was somewhere else. So he would have had to travel into 
this Vancouver for a union meeting. He's like, I will come to any meeting. I'll pay my own way just to make fight for her. I was like, I've already dealt with it, but it means a lot to me. And I'm sure it would mean a lot to her if she knew that you're fighting this hard for her, having that someone that stands up and make sure that the right thing's being done. Mm -hmm. But because that's another huge thing for, for women in the trades is pregnancy. Mm -hmm. There's chemicals, there's fumes, there's, you know, you can't necessarily lift as much. You can't fit in the same spaces. There's all these other things and hazards that you have to be aware of. And a lot of companies might not know that legally there's, there's these things that they have to do mm -hmm. that women are protected when, when they have, when they're pregnant. And a lot of companies don't realize that and they'll, or they do and they don't care and they'll try to, you know, lay someone off or not hire them back after maternity leave. And uh, the BC Center for Women in the Trades actually has a really good uh, infographic on their resources page about that they've created around all those rights that we have here in BC Fantastic. to be aware of them. And, and I share that quite commonly because you see that come up a lot on the groups like, I'm having a baby. Like, what chemicals should I worry about? Like, when do I have to go, you know, mm -hmm. off work? What Will they give me light duty? Because it's that whole other thing you have to navigate. Right. Yeah. So it's so important that those resources exist because there's so few people that are going through that you can't just go to your coworker and say hey how do I navigate this situation because chances are they don't know yes and uh, I think also one of the things that I wanted to add around that idea of how women can get involved in the trades is that I've noticed a lot of the work that I get now just as someone who does it on the side are these small odd jobs that really anyone could do and there's really good money in it but no one's willing to do these jobs. So if, if you want to build up skill sets, you know, figure out how to do something on your own home and then start offering that as a service and then do it with something else. And, you know, it might start off with, I just hang, you know, towel holders for people, but people are going to pay for that. And you can develop some skills that way and, and make a little extra money on the side. And that's been super helpful for me in, in getting my company going was just learning a skill at a time and then adding that to the repertoire of things that I can offer. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's such a good way of doing it too, right? Gaining, having that like, I have these skills. Oh, I could do this. I'm going to learn that skill and just keep adding it in. And then, like you said, creating uh, these connections with different people. For, so you get different job opportunities, share work, electrician, you know, oh, you, you're an electrician. I can, you can do this work. I can do this work. And, mm -hmm. and sharing that and growing that. I do think in the new year, we are going to have the BC Tradesman Society with some partners are going to have some kind of event around uh starting your own company like being a contractor for your mm -hmm. for yourself actually I came from two different angles the same kind of ideas so uh we'll have to see where, where those go and what that hap how those happen because that's really exciting for me it's not something I could ever do um elevators are almost always huge big companies because yeah. you need millions of dollars to start up <laughs> but I think it's awesome and when I do my renovation in my kitchen and my bathroom downstairs in my condo I'm really excited to like hire tradeswoman and a woman GC to run the project. <laughs> that sounds super exciting. Yeah. that That's one of those situations too, where the whole, you know, am I unionized? Am I not unionized? Conversation has to happen because a lot of those smaller companies are not unionized at that point in time. So just re remembering if you're going out on your own, that you're not going to have that union support that, you know, you're probably hiring contractors, subcontractors, as opposed to having employees for the first little while. And then once you get employees, then maybe navigating transitioning into a unionized world as well. Yeah. On that note, that was one thing I forgot to do when I described the BC Tradesman Society. Another reason we created it, we created it to represent all in BC. So union, non-union, retired. There's a lot of people that do trades work that aren't necessarily, it's not considered a trade per se, mm -hmm. but it's you're using tools. Also people that have never done the apprenticeship program, but they're still a trades person. So we made sure when we created that as well, that we were including all the construction building trades is kind of like the general catch-all term so if you work in the trade scope you're one of us versus some of the other the, the building trades does amazing work and build together their their group but it's you know they're a very specific group mm -hmm. and uh they have done amazing work and a lot of the work got started through them because they obviously had funding as well but they also didn't weren't able to represent everyone in bc so as we, when we created the BC Tradesman Society, we tried to make sure that we had like a nice big umbrella so we could, we could do all that. And then we get to work with uh, Build Together quite a bit. They Build Together has equal representation um, to the BC Tradesman Society on the board for the BC Center for Women in the Trades, that governance committee that we sit on. So okay. we're very like strict about that when we, when we went after the funding and all that, that we wanted to make sure that the board at all times would be 51 
or more percent trades women. We wanted to make sure we had the representation so that it didn't become like a lot of other boards sometimes end up getting like so high level that the people on the boards don't necessarily reflect that the people that they're doing the work for. Mm, right. There's a good line that I learned um, at a conference last year that I saw Governor General Canadian Leadership Conference and it was supposed to be 2020, but got pushed to 2022. And so we do all these, you meet all these different organizations, organizations and people and unions and a lot of them are doing all this amazing work. And I, one of the common threads that our group noticed is that the people that they were trying to help were involved in all aspects of the process of the decisions of how things, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Now, how are we going to deliver it? When they were involving those people, it made such a difference and they were so much more successful. Right. And people being involved in the change to help their community really makes a difference too. They feel so much more empowered. So I think the line was like, one of them said, not um, for us without us, mm -hmm. which it just makes sense. Once you hear it, I'm like, yeah, like who's going to know how to help m me be better in the trades? It's not going to be a group of like six year old white guys. It's mm -hmm. going to be other people that are tradesmen or that are underrepresented in the trade. So they know what it's like to struggle and what those barriers are and, and how to navigate around them and over them and, and how to lift each other up. That's another thing you see a lot. It's a lot of lifting up in the, in the trades for those that are underrepresented and it's, it's nice. Yeah. Well, and that kind of brings me really nicely into my next question as well, which is, um, what is your hope for the future of the BC Trades Women's Society? I'd like to, uh, we should actually probably at one point or another go after some grant money. So we're not like only funded by our $5 membership fee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so most of the events that we do, we end up finding partners and uh, we're able to get funding for specific events. So it'd be nice to go after some grant money and have a little bit more funding to continue doing that kind of grassroots work of doing meetups and, and and small events that are really catered to specific things. Also because we don't have grant money or having money coming from certain organizations, we don't really owe anyone, which is really nice. We can kind of do whatever we want in a way. So we can't like can't make that group angry. Not that we try to make anyone angry, but we try to be very honest and we don't have to really pull the punches per se. Not that we've had to do much punching, but we've had we've had people reach out to us that are at a school and they feel like something was happening at that school that was wrong and they didn't feel like it was necessarily safe for them to reach out to the HR at the school. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to help them navigate that and eventually connect them with someone and, and, and show them that these people will keep you anonymous and, you know, we will support you. Or if you want to stay anonymous this whole time and I can be the liaison and and that was able to make some changes in that school too but we were able they didn't feel confident going to the school they came to us and we were able to facilitate that change and that's great we have things like that come up pop up into our email box and then we have events and uh, we do a lot of work um, specifically lisa scott uh, she's up in prince george Cornell area she's an electrician for qp at the schools and she does amazing work around uh, indigenous youth and girls in trades so she does these cool camp youth camps and so you do all kinds of cool projects, usually for five days. And it's really nice to, for the girls or the Indigenous youth to have like a safe, safe space to kind of like excel. And it's pretty cool. Like they're soldering pipe and stuff like that. Like there's open flame. They're using drills. Like it's, it's pretty great. They all get all their safety gear on. And those are some of my favorite things to volunteer for. I was able to go up to the one. It was an Indigenous youth one. So I think it was like 10 to 12, I think was the age uh, in Terrace. And it was great. And while we were up there, we went to Prince Rupert and we went to Kitimat mm -hmm. and Terrace and we did little meetups, tradesmen meetups while we were up there. So we did three little meetups and did, at nighttime and did the camps with the kids. And that's like, that fills you up. Like doing those camps, those kids are so excited to learn all the skills and, and seeing the, seeing them help each other as well. And, mm -hmm. and then the mess that they all make when they paint, there was paint <laughs> everywhere everywhere but they had so much fun and they were so proud of themselves even at the end of the first day like I remember there was one of the moms had walked in and she was just like um can someone help me I can't get my boys out of the car so it was two brothers and I come out there and one's like holding the lock on the door and the other one had been she's like the younger one's been crying in the back and so I'm just like oh you guys want to come in it'll be really fun she's like is her cousin here yet I'm like who's her cousin and she like is I'm like I don't know I actually don't have the list <laughs> I was just like, why don't you guys come in? We'll find out. I'm sure your cousin's coming. I know we t we accepted everyone that applied. And so he was on his way. But I eventually I got the littlest one in first and then the older brother came in and they were so like just kind of mopey. I'm like, oh, here's a name tag. My name's Nicole. And 
He goes, do you recognize any of the other kids here? It's terrorists. It's not that big. There's only a couple of schools. And they're like, oh, I recognize that kid. But they're just like, <laughs> kind of mopey. By the end of the day, they were so excited. And they were like the first kids there the next day. They were like, oh, what are we learning today? What are we doing today? Do we get to use the drills again? Like, I really like, they really liked, we had the little burning for burning etching and stuff. Like, oh. what's that tool called? Gosh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Like, I always keep wanting to call it a solder gun because that's what I was using today. But, but they loved using that. They were like, they were like scratching in stuff and burning into the wood and stuff like that. But they were, it was so cool to see just that in that like 24 hours, a difference of them and them just really loving everything we did. And like, can we do this at home? And she's like, yeah, she, a lot of the projects were easy enough to do at home, like baking a little concrete planter and making a yard yacht seat. Huh. It was really fun. I, I think those programs are so helpful in terms of uh, encouraging people to join the trades too, because... I, I think back to when I was a kid, my, my parents got me a saw when I was like six or something like that. I was actually using it on a construction job the other day because I f couldn't find my, my actual saw. <laughs> but, um, you know, that that was sort of the spark. But when I really knew that I, I liked building things and I wanted to get involved in some sort of career path that involved building things was a, a summer camp that I took. And they brought us to what looked like this really crappy jungle gym, basically. And what it was is an area where you could just build whatever you want. There's scrap wood lying everywhere. Pick up some nails, pick up a hammer, and just build whatever you want. Oh, and we could build these huge structures that we were walking on. I don't know how it was ever allowed, but it was <laughs> so much fun. And um, I think more kids need to be exposed to things like that. Yeah, it's it's skills that everyone – it's never going to, like, hurt you for knowing how to swing a hammer, yeah. right, or use use a saw or use a drill. It's – they're just basic skills that everyone, I really think everyone should have. Like every time I go to my sister's house, I, I always bring my tool bag mm -hmm. and, uh, I, you know, hanging curtain rods or installing it to a lot of light. She's always buying new light fixtures. But my niece, I have, I have one niece. She's uh, turning five next year. And she'll often be like with me helping out in her princess dress. She loves Elsa, like I think almost every five to 15 year old kid mm -hmm. seems to love and so she'll be there in her princess dress with like my drill or helping and she's and she's actually really mechanical she's really good about taking things apart and so of course as a tradeswoman auntie she has all the kids tools she's got her little little chest there with a little bench and she's got all these <laughs> tools she has so many and I was like I'm so excited I was like I'm like fourth generation elevator mechanic right here I'm gonna do everything I can my sister's like easy she'll be she'll do whatever she wants almost like i'm gonna make her want to do it mm -hmm. my dad too my dad's like do you think we're gonna get another one in the family i'm like i'm trying dad <laughs> really trying hard but like at such a young age it's the fact that like she wants to play with tools like mm -hmm. i i would have played with more tools at a younger age if i'd had like if i had like kids tools i would have played with them i end up playing with real ones with my dad all the time but right i would like the old black and decker cordless drill that didn't have a lot of power he's like you can use this one with yeah. tie back your hair though yeah, exact same thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember like we were laying the subfloor for it. We we built a home or we had a contractor, but my dad did a lot of the work. And uh, I remember we were screwing down the subfloor in the bathrooms before the tile. And I was so proud of myself for helping do the work. But that's my <laughs> that Black & Decker drill that barely did anything, but was yeah. safe. <laughs> well, funny thing is my Black & Decker drill didn't come from my parents. I got it as a gift for my parents oh, sorry. because I was super into tools. Neither of my parents were. My mom ended up getting super into construction work as I was getting older but it's kind of one of those funny households now where my mom and I are the ones interested in tools and construction and my dad doesn't want anything to do with it my husband's super handy himself he's like he's refinished stuff at his house and uh it's so funny because I'm just so used to like running jobs and having an apprentice that we're doing anything around the house. I'm like, I'm like I'll just be like the one up there. I'm like, pass me this, pass me that. You set the laser over there. And he loves it because he's like, this is great. This is, yeah, I just get to hand you stuff and be your apprentice. This is so easy. It's so much better than like doing all the work like I used to have to. I was like, I'm sorry, you could do it if you want. He's like, no, no, you're doing a great job. I'll keep handing you stuff. Mm -hmm. Before I ask you my last question, is there anything we haven't talked about when it comes to women in the trades that you really want to bring up at this point? I don't know if there's anything I can think of off the top of my head besides the fact that like if you want to try something, try it, whether it be getting into the trades or a, a university program that's very underrepresented. My my stepsister is a computer scientist. Like that's the degree she went into and, and she was one of few. Try not to let that barrier of being underrepresented stop you. Mm -hmm. Find your mentorship and find people that'll help cheer you on when it's hard. 
I think that find your find your family, your chosen family. I think it was hard at the beginning of my career not having that. And once I found it, it just made it so much easier. Just having other people, they don't have to be trades people per se, but other people that just understand how some of those days it can be really hard to be underrepresented and have those those barriers that just feel like there are just so many of them and they're insurmountable. Once you have that family, I think it's pretty much, you can pretty much do anything, I think. Mm-hmm. And to build on that too, I think a lot of tasks can seem really daunting at first when you don't know a lot about it. But once you get to learning about how things in the world work, it becomes so simple. I mean, there's obviously complicated aspects to any profession, but um, like when it comes to my vehicle, for instance, I never taken any courses in how to be a mechanic but when something goes wrong and i i don't want to spend a ton of money getting someone else to do it i'll just look up a youtube video and i'll go oh it, it's just a matter of undoing a few bolts and then redoing a few bolts that's pretty easy and when you simplify it into those little tasks it becomes far more manageable so whether you're looking at getting into a career in the trades which is amazing highly encourage everyone to do that um, but whether you're looking into that or you just want to have a few extra skills to use around the house, I think it's really valuable to learn how to work with your hands, how to work with tools. Yeah. Confidence. Yeah. It, you get that confidence so quickly. It's like, I can do this. And then, like you said, YouTube videos, bolts. I can do that, too. I, I know how to, I have those wrenches already. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the things you can accomplish with a small set of tools, like an adjustable wrench and a hammer and a screwdriver, it's, it's incredible what you can accomplish. Yeah, no, I, a lot of my tools are actually my grandfather's too, which I, which makes me, makes my heart happy every time I use them. I'm like, it's great. It's grandpa's, grandpa's tools, grandpa's wrench. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's nice to have that connection. And is there anything that our audience can do to give back? So this is a question I like to ask at the end of all of our episodes. And depending on the organization, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder to answer, but like, are there volunteer opportunities with BC Trades Women's Society? Are there things that our listeners can do to make trades more accessible for women? I think the biggest thing is BC Center for Women in the Trades does a program called Be More Than a Bystander, but you just take those words itself. When you see something happening on a job site and someone being treated unfairly, just don't be a bystander. Go up to that person and stand next to them. You know, bullying happens. You don't necessarily have to like yell and scream, but just go up and be a friend and be an ally. That can make such a difference. Make sure that women and other underrepresented peoples on job sites are getting fair treatment. They're being treated safely. If you're in a position of power, make sure they're getting the right PPE. Make sure they're advancing through their career. Check in with them. Hey, do you want to learn something new? I I thought I heard you asking that you wanted to learn how to wire up that controller last week. Do you want to come do that? Like that's the biggest thing because you can only advocate so much for yourself. And I really found that those people in positions of power were actually able to advocate a lot further and get me a lot farther than I was myself just because of the position that they were in where they're more likely to be taken seriously so be more than a bystander we see something shitty happening step in Mm -hmm. don't let it happen think of like your friends and your family and how you'd want them treated how you want to be treated and make sure that you're treating people the way that you want to be treated and they deserve to be treated well what a great way to end the podcast that's some great advice thank you so much for joining me today thank you I'm also someone in the trades and I, you know, it's, it's not every episode where I get to interact with the topic from a position of knowledge and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. This has been another episode of a social justice podcast. I'm your host, Nicholas Perling. Today, I've been joined by Nicole Wheat from BC Trades Women's Society and we'll catch you in the next one. You've been listening to a social justice podcast hosted by Nicholas Sperling, brought to you by The Flag Shop and inspired by a social justice coloring book.